Middle Podcast. The podcast dedicated to the music, movies, and culture of Generation X. What is up, Slackers, and welcome to another episode of the Stuck in the Middle Podcast. I am your host, Jason Eck, and I'm just going to start off briefly and quickly. I, I mentioned last week, if you listen to the show... I don't really do politics on the show. So all I'm going to say is after last week and having an attempted assassination of a presidential candidate, we then have a president who may or may not have had a major health issue. No one knows for certain. Uh, It was actually the first time that the president has been seen today. That's President Joe Biden uh, looking a little worse for wear. Uh, Some have said it was uh, merely a really bad case of COVID. Uh, Others have said there may have been what's called an uh, ischematic stroke. I think those are called mini strokes. Regardless, like I said about an assassination attempt, like it's weird how people react to these kind of things based upon the polarity of their own political views. Um, Dude, why, why are, why is anyone saying anything that that is, I don't know, celebratory at all about people potentially dying or being killed or, or whatever. Please, please stop. Please stop doing that. I don't care what you believe. Just don't wish death on people. For goodness sake, can we have that one simple little bit of civility? You know, no matter what you think of Trump or Biden. They have families. They have people that they care about, no matter what you think of their politics. And and there are so many things that could be said about both of these men throughout their their careers in public and private life that would not hold up to any measure of scrutiny. Unfortunately, that is American politics, and that's the part that really sucks. If you're expecting that we're once again going to have like some kind of super honorable person hold this office look at every other democratic nation and of course you know people go well we're a constitutional republic and yes all those things are true but i'm just talking about in general world world democracies etc where you have voting at play i'm sorry not a ton of people who who rise to that level have done so by being super swell and and being great people Maybe there was a time that that was the case, but yeah, I, I mean, if you even have ambitions to hold the highest office of your country, to have that level of ambition, you've done some things, you know, just like I talked about with CEOs. I don't want that job. Maybe if I had my own own little company, if you know, and I'm willing to put in that work, I'll be honest. If I were to be a CEO of a company and I built it to a certain level, I, I like to say that I wouldn't just sell it. But eventually, that's what people do. They get out of the business. Maybe they start that whole process again because the energy is from the building of it, right? Of the building of a company, but the actual day in and day out, twenty four seven, total responsibility. Like it's a lot. Now imagine being the leader of a world, particularly a, a, a large nation of, of any measure, whether it's by population, whether it's by economic might, whether it's through nuclear power, the capacity to go ahead and launch a nuclear warhead, right? That's a tremendous responsibility. I'm not sure that we always get the best and brightest in these roles, but nevertheless, please, I beg of you, stop wishing death upon people. Seriously, just stop. Anyway, not what this episode is about. In fact, it's about the furthest thing away from from what we're going to be talking about this evening. Although this person doesn't, of course, make their their opinions about politics, etc. quite well known on social media. Um, But it actually stems from a. uh, So my wife has been away and I have been with the kiddos now, mind you. They're, they're kids, but they're teenagers. One is is technically an adult uh, by law. Um, and some plans fell through for my oldest son. He'd been planning a trip for, for months now. Um, he had one of the two trips that he had planned. So he has his high school buddies, his, his close-knit group of friends, and they get together 
you know, a few times throughout the summer, but they also like to get away. <clears throat> so one of his friends has a place up in Maine. Another one of his friends has a place up in New Hampshire. And, you know, they've gotten away twice now with this, this core group. And then he was planning a trip with his college buddies. And unfortunately, I, I mentioned earlier about, about President Joe Biden and COVID. It is still a thing, you know, uh, uh, COVID flus, like uh, RSV, like these things are real. They, they do happen. And it kind of dampened the trajectory of their plans because it shifted some dates because the person who was hosting got COVID. And then you have like other people in the group that were invited who have elderly family members of which that was part of their summer plans to go and visit like late later in that same week or the next week. So that put a damper on it. And that was who my son was traveling with. And yeah, it just ended up turning into Unfortunately for him, he didn't get to go away for for part of the trip. That also meant he lost income because he took the week off. <laughs> I'm sure he could have called them up and said, hey, can I get a couple shifts? And they would have accommodated. But nevertheless, that means I had some family time with my kids. And I'll just give you some quick kind of what we did. We didn't really get away and do much. Like, you know, we got out to dinner a couple of times and just kind of spending time. But so – um, one night was just me and the boys, just the three of us. And we ended up watching a movie that I've heard for the longest time was actually kind of underperformed at the box office, but has become well-regarded in time. And I will be the first to admit, I'm not a huge Tom Cruise fan. However, we decided that we were going to watch and, and they leave it to me. I go, guys, genre. And they're like, I don't know, uh, sci-fi or whatever, or action. And they threw out that. And I said, okay, we're going to watch, um, uh, I think it's uh, Edge of Tomorrow. Is that the name of it? With Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt? I think it is. Is it Edge of Tomorrow? Oh, Edge of Tomorrow. Sorry, I am also high energy and talking fast because I'm actually going to the airport this evening to pick up my wife. Thank goodness she's coming home. Um, yes, Edge of Tomorrow, Tom Cruise, Emily Blunt. If you, you haven't seen it, it's such an interesting mashup of genres. I really did enjoy it. I'm not going to give anything away if you haven't seen it. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. And enough depth to really give it a little bit of an edge. It's remarkably good. And we all got done with it saying, how was that not like a bigger hit, Tom Cruise, Emily Blunt, and a completely enjoyable story? So then um, another night, it was just my oldest and I. We ended up watching Ari Aster's uh, Ari Aster's work, uh, Midsummer. Now, uh, Ari Aster came out of the block with Hereditary as his first film, which I have yet to watch. I don't know. I think I'm a little, a little bit hesitant to watch it. There's a couple of movies that I'm hesitant to watch. I do like horror movies very much so. Um, I'm like, you know what? Midsummer seems like something that I could latch on to, um, particularly with Scandinavian background or at least culturally Scandinavian background. Um, but it was beautifully shot for, for anyone who hasn't seen it. Absolutely gorgeous. Fantastic performance by Florence Pugh. She's usually good in things, but if you like, if you like having a, a sense of completely unyielding dread throughout an entire film, I highly rec recommend Midsummer. Um, <laughs> It really just presses on your chest. I got to tell you, you feel the anxiety the entire time, in part because there's a, a huge juxtaposition in in tone and visuals because it's very bright. It's all in daytime. I often find that horror that takes place uh, that's brightly lit and in the daytime can be scarier. Um, someone is printing right now to the printer, which is unexpected. Um, so if you hear that in the background, picked up the microphone, it's our, our printer. Um, but it was absolutely gorgeous and I would actually highly recommend it. So check out Midsummer. Uh, so then it was another night. What was just me and the younger boy. And I go, dude, genre. And he throws out just action, action, like Okay, action. We could do this. We could do action. And I start looking through things and um, I'll do kind of a cross reference between, you know, Rotten Tomatoes, but like audience score because critics, critics can get it wrong so often. And surprised to see 
a Netflix movie on there, and that was Extraction, starring Chris Hemsworth. Um, just a brutal balls to the walls. I mean, you maybe get 10 minutes of exposition and you're right in to the story. You're right into the action. Um, I mean, yeah, it's balls to the walls, nonstop, um, just compelling. Uh, nothing super deep, although some of the performances were incredibly nuanced and very emotional. So when action is done right, you get a little bit of a, oh man. Um, yeah, so extraction. Uh, and then another night with the three of us again, just the boys. Typically the nights that my daughter is not here. She's either at a sleepover. Uh, she ended up going to a concert, her first concert, by the way, went and uh, saw Luke Bryan. She said it was a fantastic show. Um, but we ended up uh, again, hey, genre. And my youngest goes, um, psychological thriller, not psychological horror, psychological thriller. I'm like, okay. So going down the rabbit hole and we got something that all of us would enjoy just based upon who was involved. Ended up watching a movie from a director. I've seen a lot of his work, but not all of it. And this is one that's been on my list. And this was The Prestige, which of course is Hugh Jackman, Christian Bale, Scarlett Johansson, uh, Michael Caine, directed by Christopher Nolan. Why did I say Nolan? Christopher Nolan. Um, Wow. Wow, that movie is fascinating. Again, because it's Nolan, the pacing, the the cinematography, all of it pristine, just absolutely fantastic. Rather dark story. Um, yes, you kind of get a resolution at the end, but absolutely bonkers. Uh, I recommend it if you haven't seen it. Basically, I'm recommending everything. And then you're like, still, what's tonight episode about? What's tonight's episode about? Well, um, we had now all four of us, my wife's still away, and everyone agrees. And this is not always the case. Everyone agreed a movie on their we want to see list was The Shining, the original, right? Um, the Kubrick directed The Shining, obviously based upon. Stephen King. So that's what tonight is about. It's about Stephen King and the 70s and 80s. So the 1970s and 1980s film adaptations of his work. Now, everyone knows who Stephen King is. And I'm going to be the first to admit, I've read many of his books. But being an exer born in 1974, where his literary career began, I didn't start reading and I'm going to call it, you know, they were grown up books, right? Until my teens. So my, my early teens, I'm trying to remember what the first book I read was, but nevertheless, um, he came out of the gate so strong. So I just thought, let's go through seventies and eighties, Stephen King, because part of it is because I, I hadn't read the books, until later, I so identify with some of those those early movies in particular because, and I think all of us Gen Xers somewhat have relatable experiences of seeing things that maybe we shouldn't have when, when we saw them. Because I will tell you, when we talk about The Shining just a minute, completely different in adulthood than when you're like 9 or 10 years old. But, gotta say, that Hollywood latched on to Stephen King. Very, very quickly, very quickly, because his first published novel was Carrie in 1974. The movie Carrie came out in 1976. Brian De Palma, Sissy Spacek. But right off the right out of the gate, boom, we're in on this Stephen King guy. Now, apparently one of the guys who got his novel published, who got Carrie pushed into a larger distribution than, than original, I'm forgetting the guy's name. When he first read the book, we're just talking the manuscript, not a screenplay, just read it as a standalone novel, thought to himself, wow, this could be a movie, because he was thinking about how Rosemary's Baby became very popular and certainly a horror film. And really with with Hitchcock no longer in, you know, making films, I think at this point he had passed away or was very, very old. Um, there was like this void in the space. In, in the creative space 
for horror. And Stephen King was that guy. He came in at the right time to really just blow up the way that he did. Now, bear in mind, he had been a teacher, already talked about struggling with alcohol, and he's still just writing these books. He's doing short stories. He's doing all of it. But Carrie Boone ends up, because there was interest in making a film, got King a $200,000 advance, which immediately changed his entire situation. So remember, this is 1974. Boom, 200 Gs. He didn't need to work anymore and could focus on his craft. It's amazing. But what I always think about, so going back to being a kid, and I forget exactly where I saw it. I just remember seeing it, and it was like, this could be anywhere. It was wood paneled. I know I was with my dad, and I remember Sissy Spacek so powerfully as Carrie. That look on her face. And and when you when you see Sissy Spacek in, in other contexts, like she just looks like the sweetest person. But around that time, so not directly related to Stephen King and Carrie, is that I also so clearly remember going to my grandmother's house where she had cable and seeing Coal Miner's Daughter. And like Sissy Spacek was like the thing. So if you haven't seen Coal Miner's Daughter, uh, Loretta Lynn, she played Loretta Lynn, uh, Beverly D'Angelo from the Christmas uh, Vacation and the National Lampoon's uh, Vacation movies um, was Patsy Cline in that. Um, but oh, Levon Helms is in that, right? I think he plays Loretta Lynn's dad, Levon Helms from the band. But nevertheless, I think of Sissy Spacek. But as you go through Stephen King's films, so I'm focused on the films, of course. I think about many of my own childhood nightmares. I really do. As I'm going through it, I'm going, oh my gosh, this was nightmare fuel. One of them, which we'll talk about in just a minute, was like recurring nightmare fuel for years. A recurring nightmare that I had. And that, so uh, Carrie, book comes out 74, movie 76. The next thing that made it to air was a television miniseries by the name of Salem's Lot in 1979. Now, bear in mind, I'm five years old. And this is playing on broadcast television. I will say that I was at my grandmother's house and this was on the TV. And as also happened to me with another movie called Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Um, I came wandering down the hallway while this was on TV. So my grandmother's house is a ranch. And long corridor, bedrooms off the side, one bathroom off. And then when you got to the end of the corridor, you hook a quick left into the kitchen. Straight, though, opens up into the family room where the TV is prominently in the corner right near the fireplace. I could see it as plain as day. My great-grandmother was up from Florida visiting. She's sitting in the chair. Like this whole thing I can clearly remember. And don't you know that when I came out, it was the scene where little vampire boy is floating outside the window. Holy shit. That has stuck with me till this day. It took me until adulthood to watch that clip and not have the same visceral kind of oh, reaction that I had. I had nightmares for years about that. But what's interesting about Salem's Lot is that it is one of two Starsky and Hutch connections to the Stephen King universe, which is fascinating. So, of course, Salem's Lot was starring who? David Soul, Hutch, from Starsky and Hutch. What's really interesting is the director of this was Toby Hooper, who I think is most well-known for three key things. One, Salem's Lot. Two, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the original, the classic, as well as the first Poltergeist. This guy just needed those three things, and right then and there, you have a horror trifecta. Fantastic. But Salem's Lot, absolutely terrifying vampire story. And you go back and watch it, and it does actually hold up. Some really shocking visuals. And this was done on primetime television. Um, good stuff. So then, here we have 1980. The Shining. Just as I mentioned, Stanley Kubrick uh, starring um, uh, Jack Nicholson, 
Shelley Duvall, Scatman Crothers, and I'm forgetting Danny Danny Boyle, Danny Boyd, um, who was Danny, um, and Tony. Um, it's interesting because I would have seen that movie right around the time that it came out, which means that I would have been about six years old. Again, poor parental decisions. What do you want to do? My dad thought that this was so iconic. Like, you want to watch this. What are you going to do? Or I watched it at a friend's house. I could, I can kind of remember. But anyway, ah, when you're little and you see that movie, even if I saw it within a few years of that, maybe I saw it later. Maybe I saw it when I was like nine or ten. Holy cow. Terrifying. Terrifying. And it's so, so visceral. Right? But watching it as an adult plays completely differently. It's creepy. It does give you that sense of of dread, particularly in the, the earlier scenes. Again, daytime, driving up to the Overlook Hotel, but nowhere near as terrifying. So I'm watching this with my kids saying, hey, this is one of the all-time classics, right? Now, mind you, we all know, or you may not know, Stephen King didn't like the way that it was done. Was much more of a fan of the TV miniseries that came out either late 90s, early 2000s. That was more uh, aligned with his vision. Uh, that stars uh, Stephen Weber from Wings as Jack. So now I'm sitting with my teenagers who have seen some pretty gnarly horror movies at this point. And uh, they all thought it was good. They're like, it's a good movie. But not necessarily a, a good horror movie, which is so fascinating to me. All of a sudden, my kids sound like, film students talking about how the cinematography was beautiful and like those opening shots and oh they did that with a helicopter because there weren't drones back then and like the colors and the performances now we're now we're talking film They're like yeah it's stanley kubrick of course i'm listening to my my children say of course it's stanley kubrick he's one of the greatest of all time <laughs> so weird not a, not a bit scared of anything but admittedly it plays completely differently when you're older now, maybe this is a matter of desensitization, desensitization, do, do, do. desensitizing. I'm going to just change it. I don't know. It's killing me today. Desensit desensitation, desensitization, desensitized to content in media. Anyway, um, but the one thing that I found so interesting is because Shelley Duvall recently passed away, and they all were like, she's amazing. She absolutely is. Now, when you hear the horror stories from on set of kind of making her literally scared and and uh, I don't want to say tortured, that may be too much, but certainly put upon by Kubrick, by the other performers to try to really elicit that strong reaction out of her. But one of the things that I also thought was so interesting is how they all went, this woman is both absolutely beautiful, but also kind of ugly, which is also so interesting because Shelley Duvall was such a magnetic presence on film and these beautiful big eyes, right? And I think it comes down to the fact that, you know, her teeth were a little janky, but she's still like such a powerful performer. And it's a really interesting movie, but they all kind of laughed at the end when there's Jack out in the snow frozen. Like that was meant to be a terrifying view. And, and when I was a little kid, that was, it was terrifying. Um, but yeah, they, they, you know, there's more humor in it that I think I, I recognize that was purposeful, not incidental humor, not like, haha, looking at it in, 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 I guess, hindsight after seeing so many, seeing how horror has evolved since then, but legitimately a beautiful movie and the 4K upscaling on it, just gorgeous. It holds up as film. It's just not scary. Not really. So then we have 1980. So think about it. I just said Toby Hooper, Stanley Kubrick, and now 1982's Creep Show, directed by George C. Romero, horror legend. Now, I will admit, 
between uh, Creepshow and Creepshow 2. Uh, I don't fully remember. I know that I've seen it. I can't, for the life of me, visualize each one of the episodes. So just for you, the listener of the Stuck in the Podcast, I'm going to break down very quickly um, some of the segments here and see if you remember. All right, so Creep Show. So a horror comedy anthology directed by George, oh, George A. Romero. Why do I call him George C. Romero? George A. Romero, um, starring people like Hal Holbrook, Adrian Barbeau, Fritz Weaver, Leslie Nielsen, Carrie Nye, E.J. Marshall, and Vivica Lindforce. Uh, it is a uh, homage to the EC horror that came from Tales from the Crypt, The Vault of Horror, and the, and the Haunt of Fear. So you have a prologue where Billy Hopkins, a young boy, gets disciplined by his abusive father for reading Creepshow. Not wanting his son to be exposed to the comic's content, Stan throws it in the garbage. As Billy sits upstairs wishing that his father rots in hell, he hears a sound at the window. The source of the noise turns out to be the creep, the host of the comic book, who beckons him to come closer and removes the trash can's lid. I do remember that whole opening sequence. So you have Father's Day. Um, this is talking about how the matriarch of the family had an open secret that she murdered her late father, the miserly and domineering Nathan Grantham, who had accumulated the family's fortune through bootlegging, fraud, extortion, and murder for hire. Um, but anyway, you may remember it. Um, there's like telekinesis and all kinds of stuff that, that happens. There's a staged killing. There's a severed head covered with frosting and lit candles. You may remember that visual, um, but the ending is left ambiguous. You have the lonesome death of Jordy Verrill, which I believe stars Stephen King as Jordy Verrill, uh, which is definitely Stephen King's kind of... Um, I guess a little bit of an homage to Lovecraft. It's very Lovecraftian where uh, if you, you look at something like the color out of space kind of thing um, where <laughs> Jordy imagines selling the meteorite that he found that crashed on his farm to the department of meteors. There is no department of meteors. Um, but anyway, um, you know, there's this liquid and it, and it hurts his skin and then it it turns into like he has to chop his fingers off because there's like stuff oozing and there's a strange substance. And then eventually there's like this plant growth that takes over everything. There's this alien vegetation again, very much a a Lovecraftian kind of tale. And then ultimately he you know takes his own life, hoping that you know. This ends it, but of course, it's still spreading all the, the the plants. You have something to tide you over. I think this is the one with Hal Holbrook about a uh, vicious and heartless millionaire whose spry jocularity belies his cold blooded and murderous nature. And this is the one with like the CCTV and like there was like an affair and like people are are like double teaming and there's like the bodies left on the beach. Like this one, I do remember pretty clearly but for the longest time yeah 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 this is with ted danson yeah leslie nielsen as richard vickers um ted danson as harry wentworth galen ross as becky vickers and richard gears uncredited as the man on tv i think this is the segment that i always remember because the culprits turn out to be Harry and Becky. The two lovers have returned as waterlogged seaweed covered revenants intent on revenge on their killer. Yeah. And then they bury him up to his neck. Yeah. I remember that one clearly. You have the crate. Um, let's see. Um, wooden storage crate marked ship to Horlicks university via Julia Carpenter, Arctic, Arctic expedition, June 19th, 1834. Um, the guy who discovers it, uh, yeah, Professor Henry Northrup and his perpetually drunk, obnoxious, emotionally abusive wife, Billy. Uh, so it's Hal Holbrook and the wife is played by Adrian Barbeau. Um, let's see. 
there's a creature that's in the crate. It comes out, escapes. There's killings, all kinds of stuff. Uh, you'll go ahead and check it out. Um, they're creeping up on you. Ups and Pratt is a ruthlessly cruel business mogul who suffers from my, uh, misophobia, which has rendered him living in her medically sealed penthouse apartment outfitted with electric locks and surveillance cameras. Um, anyway, you know what? You go check it out. If you don't remember it, I just thought I would give like an overview, but I definitely remember the one about something to tide you over very, very clearly. Uh, I can just have the visual in my head of of Ted Danson. And I think part of it is because when I did see it, maybe it was already after Cheers was on the air and Ted Danson's like, you know, Sammy. But anyway, 1983. 1983 was a year that I, I was definitely um, really freaked out by the next movie that's on the list. Now, there were three adapted books at this point in 1983. This is how much of a property Stephen King had become, right? But Cujo, Cujo, directed by Louis Teague. Now, I saw this at my other grandparents' house, who were typically pretty tight with with, uh, content, unless I kind of snuck off or whatever. This is another such case where I don't know what platform was on. Maybe I'm misremembering, but I don't know how I saw Cujo. But I just remember this. I had been bitten by a dog probably when I was six, seven years old. And like, I didn't really like dogs very much. It took me a while to warm back up to them. It wasn't until my teens that I started to really like dogs. I have a dog, but like I was anti-dog. And I end up seeing Cujo, which of course stars uh, Danny Pintaro uh, from Who's the Boss? And uh, D. Wallace. And there's this, you always think of of St. Bernard's as big, lovable, heroic dogs. And here you have it rabid and like tearing the throat out of somebody. And how the mom and the son are trapped in the car and trying to make a decision about when they're going to run and make a break for it. The dog was stalking them. I remember that being so powerful the very thought of just being stuck in the car in the heat and nowhere to go because there's something out there and maybe it was because as a kid you know we often just hey wait in the car and you waited in the car could be 10 minutes could be an hour mind you we had crank windows so if you needed to roll it down you could but in this story you couldn't keep the window rolled down because you had a massive saint bernard looking to kill you but this is directed by Louis Teague, whose name will come up another time for another film of the Stephen King universe. Now, that same year, you have The Dead Zone, David Cronenberg. So, again, some great directors who are getting involved with Stephen King's work. Now, this is probably one of my least favorites, only because I felt it was – I felt it was slow. I felt it was really slow moving. Now, mind you, I think that Christopher Walken is great. I mean, think about this cast. Christopher Walken, Brooke Adams, Tom Skerritt, Herbert Lorne, Martin Sheen, Anthony Zerbe, and uh, Colleen Dewhurst, Johnny Smith, Wakens from a Coma, Psychic Powers. Now, I will tell you, I really enjoyed the television series. I mentioned uh, on the Bratz episode Anthony Michael Hall played Johnny Smith in the TV, uh, the TV series, and it was excellent. I really enjoyed it. I'm not sure I took it all the way to the end because I don't remember the resolution, but um, the dead zone refers to the part of Johnny's brain that is irreparably damaged, resulting in his dormant psychic potential awakening, which, of course, is about a potential, hmm, sound familiar, assassination attempt on the president. And that there could be, based upon whatever happens, okay? So at a political rally, Johnny shakes Stilson's hand and had a vision of Stilson as president ordering a preemptive nuclear strike on the USSR. So Johnny seeks out a friend's advice, asking, for instance, if he would have killed Adolf Hitler if he'd had the chance, knowing beforehand the atrocities Hitler would commit, Wyzak replies that he would have had no choice but to kill him. 
So Johnny decides this is something that he has to do, right? So just so you, if you don't know, Stilson grabs a baby as a human shield. I mean, are you kidding me? However, Stilson's career ends because of it. He grabbed a baby. He's not elected and then commits suicide. So even though Johnny taking the shot misses, the coward still ends up with the same outcome, right? So Christopher Walken as Johnny Smith, Herbert Lorne as Sam Wyzak, the doctor, Tom Skerritt as the sh- uh, the sheriff of the town. And then let's see who plays um, who plays Stilson. Oh, Martin Sheen. Duh. <laughs> of course it's Martin Sheen. Um, it's, it's slow and, and dark, but it's definitely a Cronenberg film. And I don't know. It's just never been my favorite. It's never been my favorite. Um, 88% on uh, Rotten Tomatoes. It's definitely well regarded. I think it's worth seeing. It's just, oh, interesting. By no means a bad film. Just a disappointingly bland and superficial one in which director Cronenberg relinquishes the one thing that has always set him apart from his colleagues, his willingness to follow his intuitions rather than the logic of the script. Interesting. Yeah, it just falls a little bit flat for me. But hey, Christopher Walken, Martin Sheen, David Cronenberg, what's not to love? Uh, So then you have, again in 1983, little bit of a well-known director that you might have heard of. Did a little bit of dabbling with horror. John Carpenter and Christine. Again, not my favorite, just because the the concept has never quite, <laughs> never quite grabbed me of a murderous car. Like, I get it. I really do. Um, you know, Christine holds a 72% approval rating. Uh, But the consensus reads, (laughs) the cracks are showing in John Carpenter's directorial instincts, but Christine is nonetheless silly, zippy fun, right? Now, at the same time, Roger Ebert says, by the end of the movie, Christine has developed such a formidable personality that we're actually taking sides during its duels with a bulldozer. This is the kind of movie when you walk out with a silly grin, get in your car, and you lay your rubber halfway down the highway. Um (laughs) <laughs> the early parts of the film are engaging and well acted, creating a believable high school atmosphere. Unfortunately, the later part of the film is slow in developing and unfolds in predictable ways. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's still, even its premise is kind of stupid fun, but the, the concept of an animate object being uh, a given ascension is an interesting concept and in conceit in, in horror. Um it's just kind of funny to think about it. Like, according to Carpenter, Christine was not a film he had planned on directing, saying that he directed the film as a job as opposed to a personal project. I mean, hey, uh, that's okay. Um, in retrospect, Carpenter stated that upon reading Christine, he felt that it just wasn't very frightening, but it was something I needed to do at the time for my career. Um. King's novel, the source material, made it clear the car was possessed by the evil spirit of its previous owner, Roland D. LeBay, whereas the film version of the story shows the evil spirit of the car manifested itself the day it was built, which is basically saying that it it achieved uh, awareness upon construction. It's it's a little little weird, probably not the kind of, um, I don't know, uh, license you should take. Um, but just very quickly, let's go through uh, Keith Gordon as Arnie Cunningham, um, really his most well-known role. It looks to be uh, either Jaws to a um, couple of De Palma films, uh, Legend of Billie Jean. So, I mean, some some good credits, nothing spectacular. Um, John Stockwell as, uh, oh, yeah, he's been in a lot of stuff. Uh, he's Dennis Gilder, former football player after injuries and Arnie's best friend, Harry Dean Stanton 
you can't go wrong with Henry, Harry Dean Stanton as Detective Rudy Junkins, a, a local police detective. Um, anyone else of note in here? Oh, Kelly Preston. Kelly Preston's in here as Roseanne, a friend of Dennis. Um, David Spielberg came up with an error. So who is who is David Spielberg? <clears throat> um, he is, in fact, not related to Steven Spielberg. Just curious, since he's in the film industry. So anyway, that's Christine. Good, dumb John Carpenter fun. Uh, next, we have 1984. We have Children of the Corn, directed by Fritz Kirch. Um, not a ton to say about Children of the Corn, other than when it came out. Even the trailer was scary. I have probably not seen it since then, to be perfectly honest with you. Great cast. Peter Horton, Linda Hamilton, John Franklin. Uh, let's see. Um, set in the fictitious rural town of Gatlin, Nebraska, which is why my wife, who doesn't like horror, also doesn't like Children of the Corn, because, of course, it's in Nebraska. Um, I just remember a lot of kids my age really being into it. Um, so I would have been, let's see, when did I say 84? Yeah, I was like 10, but I remember it still being a topic for a few years later, particularly as home video became everywhere, right? So I was in the choir. So I was raised in the congregational church of which my grandfather was part of the adult choir, and I became part of the children's choir. And there was this older boy, because you could be in the children's choir up till I think... 16 or 17 years old, something like that. And he was older and he was naughty and he always thought he was cool. But he convinced a bunch of us because we were young, we were kids to be naughty in church that during the refrain of one of the hymns where it says we are the children of the Lord, that we would all say we would all sing. We are the children of the corn. Now, I'm sure that so many kids, church choirs throughout the United States did the same bullshit based upon Children of the Corn. Um, but it's it's scary-ish. Do you know what I mean? It's it's on its face terrifying in concept of, you know, these <laughs> Roger Ebert said, by the end of the Children of the Corn, the only thing moving behind the rows is the audience fleeing to the exits. So as movies go, Children of the Gore Corn is fairly entertaining if you can stomach the gore and the sound of child actors trying to talk in something that might be called Farm Belt Biblical. Um, let's see. Uh, poor, p obvious budgetary constraints, poor effects, and ludicrous monster movie denouement, and calling it lame and gratuitous visual style. Or also, as it was called, lean, brutally tense slasher film. Now, this has been done a few times now. There's been uh, The Children of the Corn, uh, a couple of sequels, none of them really with uh, Stephen King's involvement. But nevertheless, it was released as Stephen King's Children of the Corn in 1984. Also in 1984, I'm telling you, Hollywood was in love because horror sells the box office typically, even if it's not necessarily good. Let, OK, hold on. Let's see. So I'm saying this. Let's just very quickly look at the movies I've already mentioned. Carrie had a budget of one point eight million, did thirty three point eight at the box office. The Shining, um, 19 million, did forty seven point three at the box office. Cujo, six million, made twenty one point two million. So far, everything's making money. Let's see. Uh, Dead Zone budget seven point one, did about twenty point eight million box office, another sixteen point three million rentals. So now you have the rental VHS market in play here. Uh, Christine, ten million dollar budget, twenty one million dollars at the box office. Children of the Corn. <laughs> Doesn't say how much it was made for. They said it was made for something cheap. Did $14.6 at the box office. Not, not a strong showing. So now here we are, Firestarter, with one of my favorite Gen Xers, of course, Andrew Barrymore, 1975. Uh, E.T., right? Little Gertie, adorable. And here she is 
as the fire starter with David Keith, Drew Barrymore, Martin Sheen once again, George C. Scott, which was shot in and around Wilmington, Chimney Rock, and Lake Lure, North Carolina. And this $12 million budget, 17.1 box office, another 18.9 in rentals. I remember this being a big deal on VHS, and I'm pretty sure that's where I first saw it. Um, David Keith, go check him out. You'll see him and you go, oh, yeah, that guy. And you look at his body of work, you're going to know exactly who I mean. Um, Heather Locklear was in this. That's right. Holy cow. Crazy. But little girl with, you know, telekinetic powers. She could, what do they call her, actually? Um, she had a different name, right? Wasn't it pyrokinetic? Pyrokinetic? Yeah. Pyrokinetic abilities. Um, let's look at some of the reviews here. Um, Firestarter's concept hews too closely to other known Stephen King adaptations, though it's got nice special effects and scenery chewing George C. Scott. <laughs> Roger Ebert. Oh, I miss Roger Ebert. The most astonishing thing about it was how boring it is. There's not a character in this movie that is convincing, even for a moment, nor a line in this movie that even experienced performers can make real. And we don't feel sorry for Barrymore because she's never developed as a believable little girl, just a plot gimmick. And after seeing a rough cut, Stephen King declared one of the worst of the bunch, saying that he it was flavorless. Wow. And then he and the director later fought over the comments. Wow. Okay. Well, anyway, I still think it's good, goofy, fun. If nothing else, you get Drew Barrymore. And um, yeah, Mark Lester, I got to tell you, um, did very few things, but he's most known for probably Firestarter, Commando with Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, Armed and Dangerous with John Candy and Eugene Levy, uh, and Showdown in Little Tokyo starring Dolph Lundgren and Brandon Lee. I got to give him props for that one because I really enjoyed that freaking movie. I went back and watched it after the Brandon Lee episode. Good stuff. Dolph Lundgren underrated, as was Brandon Lee. So let's see here. Uh, and then that brings us to 1985. Once again, we get Drew Barrymore. And this is Cat's Eye. Now, she was in just one of the segments. And um, I remember at this point, I already told you that with Cujo, I didn't really like dogs. Then I was freaked out about cats and that cats were like going to steal your breath. And like, it wasn't the cat. It was like this little creature. Um, but basically, there's three stories. There's Quitters Incorporated, um, which is a place that will help you quit smoking. Um, so the... The whole premise is um, the clinic has a 100% success rate due to a uniquely persuasive method. Every time you smoke a cigarette, horrors of increasing magnitude will fall his wife and daughter, right? And then you have a tomcat that is like working between the different things. Um, so then he demonstrates the first of these horrors. The cat is put in a cage and tormented with electric shocks coming from the floor. He explains that if his new client is caught with a cigarette, Cindy will be shocked while he is forced to watch. For subsequent infractions, Alicia will be shocked. Then she will be raped. Finally, Dick himself will be killed, and he hides these threats from his families. Um, yeah. Take it from there. It just goes crazy, and yeah. Um, the ledge. Uh, it's about a man. Oh, wait, is the same guy? No, the cat escapes. That's right. Where it sees the cat sees the disembodied girl's image once again, asking for help. Oh, yeah, this is all too complex. Um, I think I have to go back and watch this. I mean, you have this like troll that takes up residence in the house and it just gets more and more bonkers. I saw this in the movie theater. Um Back in 1985, I was 11 years old, and I think it was the first time I was allowed to, like, go to a movie like this. Um, just fun stuff. Uh, but also, in 1985, uh, we have Silver Bullet. Silver Bullet, I saw um, at this, like, couple's house that was, like, a friend of my mom and her boyfriend at the time. Um, 
yeah, I can't even get a couple of those stories with with these people. Um, nothing bad, just interesting and a little tawdry. Um, but Silver Bullet, right, which is based on the Stephen King novella Cycle of the Werewolf. It stars Gary Busey, Everett McGill, Corey Haim, uh, with Megan Follows, Terrence O'Quinn, Lawrence Tierney. Anyone else interesting here? Uh, the film was directed by Dan Atias. I didn't really see much else. He then switched to mostly television direction, of which he uh, has received two Emmy Award nominations for directing for Entourage. But as far as film goes, this is one of, I guess, his his peak things. But this is about um, Werewolf. And it's been so long. I think wasn't someone in a wheelchair in this and he had to load it with um, the silver bullet. Um, I mean, isn't there someone in a wheelchair in this? Um, I thought so, but I don't know. It's been a million years. Um, yeah, yeah. Marty. Yeah. Corey Haim. He's in a wheelchair because he'd been in an accident. Um, and red gives Marty a custom built wheelchair motorcycle, which he names nicknames the silver bullet as well as a pile of fireworks. We can have his own celebration. So Marty uses the silver bullet to go out in the middle of the night to a bridge where he lights the fireworks, which, of course, catches the werewolf's attention and it confronts him. But he escapes after launching a rocket into the creature's eye. And then we find out that the reverend is missing an eye. So take it from there. But yeah, Corey Haim, another one. Man. Corey Haim didn't even make it to 40. Damn. But anyway, loved Silver Bullet. Lots of fun. Good stuff. So now that brings us to 1986, where things could not be more divergent in the world of Stephen King. Because you have Stephen King's first directorial debut, his only directing credit. And some guy by the name of Rob Reiner, who might have made a good movie or two. So 1986 gave us both Stand By Me and Maximum Overdrive. So two very different different parts of of Stephen King's universe, of course, where you have um, Stand By Me, right, which is based on uh, Stephen King's novella, The Body, which is derived from the, from the name, by the way, Stand By Me, okay? Um, but it was nominated for Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay, two Golden Globes, including Best Drama and Best Director, and is considered by many to be one of the most influential films of the 1980s. Starring Will Wheaton, River Phoenix, Corey Feldman, Jerry O'Connell, and Kiefer Sutherland. Now, I think you all know what the movie's about. And it says, hey, you guys want to see a dead body, right? And this, really a story, uh, multiple stories, I think most importantly, of these, these four boys who are very much in this together, right? And their own trials and tribulations about, you know, kind of starting to come of age, particularly at, you know, 12 years old and, and puberty and these relationships that you have. And, you know, as they talk about, you know, having really, you know, here, here's how the story ends. I never had any friends later on, like the ones I had when I was 12. Jesus, does anyone? Before going outside to play with his friends. So, of course, you have Will Wheaton as uh, Gordy, uh, later played by Richard Dreyfuss, um, who is credited as the writer. River Phoenix is Chris Chambers. Corey Feldman is Teddy DeChamp. Jerry O'Connell is Vern Tessio. And Kiefer Sutherland as the big bad John Ace Merrill gang leader. This is certainly that time of Keith or Sutherland being the bad guy. I think he plays it exceptionally well. Um not that he can't play heroic very well, too. Uh, he's just one of those actors, obviously a famous family. Uh, recently, his father, Donald Sutherland, has passed away. Um, but let's see here. Filmography. Um, so Stand By Me was 86. Lost Boys was 87. I mean, there you go. Right out of the gate. He had a couple of, uh, you know, earlier, <clears throat> earlier roles like Max Dugan Returns. He's in it. Uh, the Bay Boy. Don't know what that is. Uh, At Close Range. Stand By Me. 
Crazy Moon, Promised Land, The Lost Boys, The Killing Time, Bright Lights, Big City, Young Guns, 1969. So just starting to hit on all cylinders at that point. And really his career has never looked back. And I mean, he is, he's got a credit almost every year, seemingly through this, through this day. And that's with, you know, 10 years of 24. Uh, yeah. So this was him coming into his own, as well as all that group of, of young actors who would go on to have multiple films over the next decade or so. But on the other side of the coin, you have Maximum Overdrive, I think most uh, well known for the iconic vision of the uh, Green Goblin truck. This is starring Emilio Estevez, who has gone on to say it's not a great movie, but he said Stephen King absolutely tried his best. I think it is good, stupid fun. I think Stephen King has talked about his own uh, penchant for drug use, etc., maybe not being up to the task. Um, I don't care. The It's good fun. It's just good fun. It's not meant to be deep. It is not a great movie by any any stretch of the imagination. But the soundtrack, Who Made Who, You Shook Me All Night Long, Hell's Bells, um, King disowned the film, describing it as a moron movie and considered the process a learning experience after which he intended to never direct again. It had a budget of $9 million. The box office did 7.4. I would be really curious to know what it did in aftermarket rentals. Cause I feel like every single one of us probably Rented that movie at least once. That's just me. Um, the <laughs> the reviews were not kind, and we'll just leave it at that. I think it's a really super interesting concept. Um, it, it's a mixture of of everything in in a way from like Matrix and Terminator and you know Aliens, uh, just rebellion of technology in concept. I think it's excellent. Execution, great, no, but also some really iconic moments. You know, a, a, a vending machine just killing people with cans of soda? It's brilliant. So Stephen King, I think you're too hard on yourself. I think it's a lot of good, stupid fun. Now we have 1987 Creepshow 2. Not a lot to get into there. Um, but then also in 1987, again, a different corner of of Stephen King's mind, you have The Running Man. Now, The Running Man, of course, stars uh, Richard Dawson, who is most well known for one of two things, uh, Hogan's Heroes or Family Feud, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Now, of course, this is a competition. Here, let, let me do the, the write-up here. Um, where did it go? Okay. Um, so it is a dystopian action film. Um. It's set somewhere between 2017 and 2019 in a television show where convicted criminal runners must escape death at the hands of professional killers. This is based upon a novel of the same name, which was written under his pseudonym, Richard Bachman. Uh, it was a moderate success, $27 million budget, $38.1 million at the box office. Um, so, of course, you, you have to see it for yourself, but they are first attacked by the stalker Sub-Zero. Think about this, like a bad guy named Sub-Zero, um, Dynamo, Buzzsaw. It's like American Gladiators, right? Think about that in concept. And let's see, when was the original novel written? It was written in 82. It's before any of those concepts, so it's really quite ahead of its time. But you have Arnold Schwarzenegger as Captain Benjamin Stewart, Ben Richards, Maria Conchita Alonso as Amber Mendez, Richard Dawson as Damon Killian, Yafet Koto as William Laughlin, Jesse Ventura as Captain Freedom. And that's a bad, because Jesse kind of has like a different tone to his voice because he's got that Minnesota, uh, Minnesota thing. Man, if you ever see Will Sasso doing his Jesse Ventura, it's freaking brilliant. Um, let's see. Jim Brown as Fireball. Erland Van Light as Dynamo. Marvin McIntyre as Harold White. Uh, uh, let's see. Gus Rethwatch as Buzzsaw. Professor Toro Tanaka as Professor Sub-Zero. Mick Fleetwood as Mick. 
Dweezil Zappa is Stevie. It's crazy. But it's it's just a pure, pure actioner. I mean, Roger Ebert gave it two and a half stars, complaining that all the action scenes are versions of the same scenario. I, I mean, it is. It is. It's just slightly different, some cool gadgetry and, and those kind of things, but still good, dumb, fun. And Richard Dawson is awesome in this because it's so against type. So I like it. Um, so then the last movie for 1989 is one of my favorite horror movies of this timetable. In part because you have the great title song by a little old band called the Ramones. And of course, I'm talking about 1989's Het Cemetery. Fred Gwynn, first and foremost, you gotta talk about Fred Gwynn, best known as Herman Munster. And the whole the whole cast did an excellent job. Gage Creed is, of course, um, the little kid in this, right? And Miko Hughes is known for Pet Cemetery, but also Kindergarten Cop. Apollo 13, Mercury Rising, Wes Craven's New Nightmare, as well as being on Full House. You remember that? From 1990 to 1995. You see his face and you go, holy shit. Well, just so you know, that kid is 38 years old now. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, but, I mean, he's done work in various different ways, like film and TV. Like, uh, it's pretty impressive actually um and sometimes it's voice acting yeah so good for him but nevertheless um dale midkiff in the lead again you see him you know him um i'm sure you've seen the movie but this is how uh the pet cemetery can bring people back it brings people back and just that gnarly scene with gage um, who goes ahead and attacks Judd. That's that's Fred Gwynn. Absolutely brutal. The really the opening sequence that that brings you Gage's death. I never even really thought much about it until I became a parent. And I watched this somewhere around the time when I first had kids. And it really the movie takes on a completely different vibe. When you when you have kids, it really does. And the lengths of which will go as parents and just the 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 deep grief that would be accompanied by this. Uh, but it's also as the mom was uh, Denise Crosby, who was Tasha Yar on Star Trek Next Generation. Um, awesome. But yeah, I highly recommend Pet Cemetery. Uh, I think they had a remake just a couple years ago, which I haven't checked out yet. Um, but here's the other note. So. In this time span, right, from his first novel being published, Carrie, 1974, the movie comes out in 76, then Salem's Lot comes out in 79, because obviously he's still writing, actively writing and getting things to the marketplace. But once the 80s roll, there is at least one project, if not multiple projects, Every single year of the decade, except 1981 and 1988. Here's where it gets even crazier. When you then extrapolate out into the 90s, right? In the 90s, you got 90, 92, um, nothing in 91. 93, 94, 95, um, 96, 97, 98, 99, 2000, um, nothing in 2002, nothing in 2002, three, four, five, nothing in 06, seven, uh, nothing in eight, but then, uh, nine, 
Nothing in 10 or 11. Then 12, 13. I mean, it's crazy. 13, 14. Um, nothing in 15. Then it goes 16, 17. Um, nothing in 18. Then 19, 20. Nothing in 21. 22, 23. You have two things coming up. 24, 25, and a bunch of stuff in development. So basically, since 1979, there's been only a handful of years that something has not been released, either to television. Oh, actually, you know what? A couple of those years that I mentioned? No, yeah, I caught it all. Yeah, I caught it all. Because I'm looking at TV adaptations, film adaptations. Yeah. I mean, it still continues to this day. He continues to write. And yeah, he has stuff constantly being developed and released for Hollywood. Pretty impressive career. But that is the 1970s and 1980s Stephen King film adaptations. And yeah, some good stuff. What are some of your memories? And did you start reading the books before or after? So for me, being in 74... I didn't start reading his books until probably 80. I probably started like 85, 86, somewhere around there. And then I haven't read everything. I read what I like. If something piques my interest, I'll read it. Um, You know, I started to fall in love a little bit with Clive Barker for a while. Um, But yeah, what are your favorites? Which order did you you see these in? Read them or see them? Um, did it inspire you to read the books? Maybe you only watch the movies. I'd love to know. So how do you do that? You can email me at stuckinmiddlepod at yahoo.com. You can find me on Instagram, X, and YouTube at StuckPodX. Head on over to the Facebook page, Stuck in the Middle, a Gen X podcast. Please like, comment, share, leave five-star reviews, and most importantly, please subscribe to the podcast. So until next time, later, slackers.